Kids are buying and smoking cigarettes in record numbers. Kids are becoming addicted to nicotine in record numbers. Now a lot of kids want to change that, and so does the President of the United States. Time to talk. Maybe time to do something. This is a Nick News Special Edition. Clearing the air, kids talk to the President about smoking. And now, here is Linda Ellerby. Hello. This program is about smoking and kids. Our guest is President Bill Clinton, who has strong feelings on this subject and some ideas about what to do. Welcome, Mr. President. Thank you, Linda. I'm glad to be here We're with all of you. We're delighted to have you here. We are here today because of some disturbing facts. After 10 years of holding steady, cigarette smoking is rising among young Americans. According to the University of Michigan, which has been studying this problem, a great many who will eventually be smokers have already begun to smoke by age 13. Now, why is that? Well, for one thing, you can. Cigarettes are easily available to kids, and in the media, smoking looks cool. Begin with this. According to the United States Food and Drug Administration, 91% of six-year-olds know who Joe Camel is and what he sells. Here's more. Children are crucial to the tobacco industry. Each day, 3,000 kids smoke their first cigarette. That's more than one million kids a year. Smoking is an addiction that starts in childhood. It's a cartoon <laughs> picture. <laughs> I know, but it still influences kids. See, they even make the camels pretty. My name is Jean Kilborn, and for about 15 years, I've been giving lectures all around the world on tobacco advertising. I don't really know why people smoke. I just think it's really stupid. The tobacco industry encourages people to smoke. If you just looked at the advertising, you'd think that everybody's smoking. I see cigarette ads in magazines. The Joe Camel cartoon figure might be meant to attract kids. The tobacco industry is in the business of getting children addicted to nicotine, which means they have to sell cigarettes where children will see them. There are just billboards right on top of the candy sometimes. They make it very easy for children to get cigarettes. Kids start smoking because they think it's cool. Because children are their most important customers. We believe that there's no cigarette advertising on television, but in fact there's an enormous amount of cigarette advertising on television because of the sponsorship of sporting events. We have race cars with cigarette names all over them. That's a form of advertising. No, I don't think ads make me want to smoke cigarettes. There's a kind of advertising that goes on in films too, where people are paid to smoke in the films and paid to use a certain kind of cigarette brand. Sometimes I notice people smoking cigarettes in movies and television. But there's also a kind of advertising that we don't often recognize called promotion, where you can get t-shirts and caps to wear with the brand name. That's an ad. Yes, they come in the mail. Cigarette companies have known for a long, long time that cigarettes are dangerous to our health. Smoking can cause lung cancer, and in effect, you can die. There's no question about that. Smoking kills 400,000 Americans every year. So a good question is, well, why do they continue to sell cigarettes if they know that cigarettes can kill us? The tobacco industry needs 5,000 new smokers every day to replace those who quit or die. Unfortunately, profits are as addictive as nicotine. We all believe that advertising doesn't influence us at all. No, I wouldn't try, want to try a cigarette because just because someone else does it that I like. But the truth is that advertising does influence us. Would the tobacco industry be spending $6 billion a year on advertising and promotion if it didn't influence people to smoke? We invited representatives from the Tobacco Institute and R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company to participate in this program, but they declined. The R.J. Reynolds Company wrote to say that it, too, is against young people smoking and reminds us to remind you that the Federal Trade Commission investigated and decided that the Joe Camel ads did not break the law. Now, let's talk. Mr. President, these kids have a lot of questions for you, but before we start, is there anything you'd like to say to them? Just that uh, you saw the show, this, this little clip, made it clear what my, my concerns are. The, uh, the real problem in this country with smoking is that we now have lots and lots of evidence about the health problems associated with, with the cigarette smoking. If 3,000 children a day start to smoke, we know that 1,000 of them will have their lives shortened. <clears throat> That's a big concern for the president. I want all of you and all the people your age to have a long, full life, to, to be able to do whatever you want with your lives. 
And I think that in order to do that, we're going to have to do something to, to reduce dramatically the number of young people smoking. Mr. President, why do you think that the cigarette companies direct all their ads to the young people? I don't know that they direct all their ads to the young people, but I think that the ads are designed to be attractive to young people. 86% uh, of the young people who smoke, smoke the three most advertised brands, the cigarettes. Only 35% of the adults who smoke, smoke the three most advertised brands of cigarettes. So that shows you what an impact the advertising has on young people. We have some questions from kids who, uh, that we've videotaped around the country, and I'd like to go to one of those right now. Okay. Hi, I'm Eric from Magnolia, Ohio. I would like to know what the United States is doing to keep kids off of cigarettes. Well, the Food and Drug Administration has put out a proposal which would uh, restrict advertising, would say there could be no advertising at all within a thousand feet of a school it would say that uh, all advertising of cigarettes should be in black and white, that there shouldn't be any Joe Camel. And then I think that, that in the magazines where there's a lot of readership among young people, uh, there should be black and white advertising only, not those color ads. And the other, the outdoor ads, I think, should be black and white. All those things would tend to reduce the exposure of young people to, uh, to the advertising, and I think would help us to bring the cigarette smoking rate down. It's been found that nicotine is an addictive drug, and it's also been found that nicotine is a property in cigarettes. Uh, why are cigarettes not already regulated by the FDA? We at the national level, we're, we're trying to do something about this. The Food and Drug Administration believes that they have enough evidence to say that nicotine is probably a drug. But they have also given this period of comment. They're now analyzing these comments to see whether there's any evidence to the contrary. Now, Tanya has asthma, <coughs> and her parents are divorced, and she's unable to visit with her father as much as she would like because of her asthma, because he smokes. What's your question, Tanya? I want to know, can we make more, like, billboards showing the cons of smoking? That's a good idea. One of the proposals that uh, we've made through the Food and Drug Administration is that the uh, cigarette companies should help us to fund a national advertising campaign to warn young people about the dangers of smoking, to present the other side. You know, there's just hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars being spent to advertise the product, and almost no money on the other side being spent to tell you what the dangers, what the flip side is, what the risks are. Have any of you all ever tried to go in and buy cigarettes to see if you could? Raise your hand if you, if you have. And I could mean, you? I bought 23 separate packs. I said that I was 18. That she said she wouldn't believe me because I was, like, short. But she, <laughs> she didn't really ask for the ID or anything, like what is it for or anything. I, I believe that the stores should be checked more. I think they should ask for ID in selling cigarettes just the way liquor stores have to ask for ID in selling liquor. We have another question on videotape. Hi, my name is Sean. I'm from Marmore, New Jersey. What I'd like to know is why you allow people to smoke. Yeah, well, we why allow... do you allow people to smoke? <laughs> Well, for one thing, it's, smoking itself is not a crime. It's illegal to sell cigarettes to young people, but it's not illegal for adults to smoke. And so the, not the president or anyone else can stop people from doing something that's not illegal. So, okay, if cigarettes are so bad for us, why don't we pass a law making them illegal? That's what most kids said when Nickelodeon went online and talked to them about this issue. Just outlaw cigarettes, they said. Well, why not? because we don't live in a perfect world. This farm has been in our family for about three generations. My name is Ron Burnett. I'm 12 years old and I live on a tobacco farm in North Carolina. This is basically what's in cigarettes, except what's in cigarettes is ground up. There are a lot of jobs that are created in North Carolina by the tobacco industry. You can ride through Oxford and see many types of businesses that are directly involved in the tobacco process. We probably have somewhere in the order of 100,000 people employed in the tobacco industry. I'm Carl Sopley. I am the tobacco specialist with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Farmers like the Burnett's face a rather uncertain future. 
on this particular road I live on. 20 years ago, it was eight families making a living on that farm, and now it's down to two. No other crop can bring in for us the income that tobacco brings in. Because most other crops don't get as much money. For example, the money that Ronnie may make on one acre of tobacco for other crops like soybeans or wheat or corn, he would have to grow hundreds of acres. We rely heavily on that income to sustain us, to save for Ron's college education, to make sure that we have a secure future. Another issue, of course, is the negative press. This is a, a legal crop in the United States, and some people are making the farmers feel like what they're doing is less than honorable. It brings in about $13 billion in federal, state, and municipal taxes here in North Carolina and across the country. Now, that's a lot of money that go to support schools, hospitals, just about anything you can imagine that's going on in our communities. So even though tobacco gets a bad name in some respects for health issues, it's certainly making a tremendous contribution. So that we see that it's, it's never as simple as it looks. Jenny, you had a question. Um, if tobacco is banned, what would you do to support the minority tobacco farmers in the South? Uh, you got to remember, a lot of these folks have been doing this in those tobacco growing states literally for more than 200 years. So one of the big challenges, I think, is to develop some sort of uh, plan in the states where tobacco is grown that to really help farmers if they want to do something else. What do you think about secondhand smoke? I think it's something that we all need to be sensitive to, not only because of the prospect of, uh, of you know, cancer and, and really serious things happening from exposure, but a lot of people have allergies, a lot of people have asthma, a lot of people have other things that are aggravated by exposure to secondhand smoke. And Sammy has a question, but I want to tell you something about Sammy. Sammy wrote to the New England Journal of Medicine to ask them <laughs> why his Marvel comic trading cards had people smoking cigarettes on them. And because of his letter, Marvel actually changed their cards and took the cigarettes off. So. This is somebody who's done something. Good for you. What's your question, Sam? What, is the, what do you think is the most effective way to teach kids not to smoke? I think to talk honestly with them about what the problems are. I think to tell them that, uh, that it's not a cool thing to do, it's not a good thing to do, and the risk of something bad happening are very high. Why would anybody take that kind of risk? You know, one thing I'd like to say just for a minute is that you wrote that letter to the New England Journal of Medicine, and it caused a big comic book company to change the whole way they were advertising their cards. I think that you should not, any of you, underestimate the ability of people at the grassroots level to change the behavior of America when it comes to smoking. You know, if, if you have young people signing up to pledge to be smoke-free, if you do uh, reports at school and, and, and spread information about why people shouldn't smoke, if you get your schools to be smoke-free environments, if you do those basic things, and then look for opportunities like Sammy's opportunity to in reach into the so larger society and get them to change practices, I think that will make a big difference. If you go in and highlight the fact that, that uh, people who are selling cigarettes over the counter aren't checking as closely as they should for whether young people are old enough to buy cigarettes, all these things can change our country uh, just as much, sometimes even more, than changing laws can. As a child, did you smoke, and what influenced you? My mother was a heavy smoker, but I didn't like it, and I didn't <coughs> smoke. And I'm one of those statistics. When I was older, actually, uh, I smoked a pipe for about four years in the wintertime, and I smoked cigars occasionally for a few years. Do you still smoke a cigar? The last one I, I, I did was I smoked a, a cigar symbolically when Captain O'Grady was liberated from uh, Bosnia. But basically, I don't anymore because I don't think that I, sh I think it does not set the kind of example I should set since I'm president. I shouldn't do it. Jana has a very interesting question. Jana, are you there? You back there? Yes. <laughs> what can be done about bubble gum and candy cigarettes and bubble pipes? Because if children get that kind of mentality, the smoke mentality at a young age, then it might stick with them with them when they grow older. I think you ought to do uh, with that what uh, Sammy did on the on the cards. I think that young people should say, hey, we, we should write to these companies. In large numbers, you should write to the companies that produce them and say, we like your bubble gum, but you're giving out an image or an impression 
that this ought to go from here to smoking, and we don't think you mean that, so why don't you stop it? Put a different shape on your bubble gum. That's what I think you ought to do. How can a kid ask a grown-up to stop smoking? Oh, I think uh, directly. I think children should not be self-conscious about that. Uh, I can tell you, you know, what Ch Chelsea uh, did some very blunt things to, to uh, her grandmother. She said, you ever seen a picture of a lung where people have smoked for years as against a picture of a lung where people haven't? I mean, very, you know, straightforward stuff. Did it work? Uh, it, it worked. It took a few years, but it worked finally. On my daughter's eighth birthday, her grandmother's present was that she quit smoking. So I think, I think kids, in a funny way, grown-ups are are more open to children being blunt and direct with them sometimes than they are to other grown-ups doing that. If one grown-up says that to another, they may be offended. If a child says it, it's so obviously said from the best of motives, with the best of heart, that I, I think that the children can have a big impact on that. How would you deal with it if somebody close to you, such as your daughter, started to smoke? Well, I would talk to her about it. I would just, uh, I would be surprised because she's uh, always been more militant than I have. But if she did it, if something happened, if something happened and she did that at some point in her life, I would, uh, I would just have a very straightforward conversation with her about it. I would remind her of all the things she said to me over the years and what the evidence is of the risks. And I would tell her that I thought it was not a risk worth taking. No, it's not. <clears throat> it's really not. In fact, just how bad is tobacco and how hard is it to quit? Worse and harder than you think. Cigarettes are, have been called, and probably are, killers that travel in packs. As for quitting, Mark Twain did say it was the easiest thing he ever did. After all, he said he'd done it a thousand times. I started smoking when I was 18 years old. I quit three years ago. Now, when I go hiking, I run out of breath quicker than my friends who have never smoked. But it's getting better all the time. I'm lucky. Some aren't. Here are two stories. When I first started smoking, I was in sixth grade. I was about 12 years old, and I did it as a popularity thing. I wanted to stand out in a crowd, be like young and beautiful. I wanted to be like my mom. My name is Melanie Petzold. I'm 16 years old. Watching <clears throat> Melanie pick up the habit has made me feel guilty. My name is Deborah Breniak. I'm Melanie's mom. I've been smoking since I'm 13, so it's got to be about 25 years. I wanted to be an adult for 13, so I started smoking. I looked cool. I looked grown up. See, I made it. I decided to stop smoking because I was scared that I might die of cancer. Dear diary, my dad has cancer. I am very frightened. I have been making signs that say, feel better, daddy, but I don't want him to die. How you doing? My name is Rachel Krieger. I'm nine years old. My dad has lung cancer. My name is Dave Krieger. I'm Rachel's father. Uh, I smoked for about 20 years. I started 12 years old. It was stupid. <laughs> lung cancer is a terrible thing, and you can die from it. Him being sick is very scary for me, and I just wish this whole thing never happened. He would have not gotten sick. I personally believe that I could quit any time I wanted to. I was wrong. I would go through nicotine withdrawals where I would go into a blind rage. It's really, really hard. Stopping is unbelievable. I have my monkey. <laughs> it's like a monkey on your back that don't get off. The nicotine is a drug. I think that I am addicted. <laughs> Dear Diary. My dad went to the hospital yesterday and is coming back tomorrow. He had a very big operation on his side. He is very much in pain, but every night I pray he'll be okay. I wouldn't smoke because I wouldn't want to get lung cancer and I wouldn't want to go through what my dad went through. When I see my mom smoking and I'm trying to quit smoking, it's a little weird to think that I'm trying to save my life and. She won't bother. I still like smoking, but if it depends on my daughter smoking or not smoking, I think maybe we should do it together. Together. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. 
Mr. President, do you have any final thoughts for kids on this issue? You young people cannot believe the potential influence you can have. You can ask adults the kind of hard questions you ask me. You can encourage every adult you care about and love to stop smoking. You can, you can make it so that the cool thing to do is not to smoke instead of to smoke. And you know, no one, none of us are going to live forever, but you have the choice to maximize, to increase the chances of your living a long and full life. This is a choice you can make. The smoking choice is a choice you can make. It's totally within your control. And I just want to encourage you. I'll do what I can, but I want to encourage you to do everything you can uh, to get everybody you know to remain smoke free. I think that is the, that's the answer. And you can do it. We can change this country if we do it together. Thank you very much. This program has indeed been about choice, your choice. You can choose to smoke or you can choose not to smoke. It is your choice. You can choose to be influenced by people who would make money off your smoking or you can choose not to be. It is your choice. Making choices always requires courage, but first, it requires knowledge. Know where you stand. I'm Linda Ellerby. Goodbye for Nick News.